Um, this is the More Than a Walk podcast. Um, I'm Malcolm. I'm here with a very, very, very special guest, uh, Guy Fisher, who's here to talk about a um, a rare uh, disease called amylo- amyloidosis. Amyloidosis. Am- amyloidosis. Amyloidosis. You see, I'm practicing. I'm learning uh, a lot of things mm-hmm. today. You guys are going to learn. This is a great, great episode. Um, um, you just heard him. He was talking about um, how this disease, it shows up and black people especially and it looks like something else it looks like a heart failure, heart failure. um but really it, it's something more than that so um please listen to this whole episode because um we really get into the the weeds about how he found out about it and then also how his life has changed since then um and we talk a lot about black on black healing yep. so um yeah please enjoy we're going to jump right into the conversation thank you what did you do uh, professionally? I uh, own a cybersecurity company. Oh, wow. You know, so I've been in the cyberspace for, you know, over 30 years. Wow. And, How did uh, you get involved with that? Well, you know, I started with the networking and then networking um, stuff expanded from from intranet to the internet. Mm-hmm. So the first thing that we had, people had to start doing was learning how to protect Mm-hmm. You know, and then as you realize that there was so much business in the internet that we had to make sure it was secure. So it just manifested from now. That makes sense. It so, makes a lot of sense. And then after a while, you know, as you do consulting work, you realize that your customers are your customers. So mm-hmm. After a while, you say, why am I doing this for the man? Well, for for enterprise, I can do it for myself. And yeah. It take so you've been you on your own mm-hmm. permanent. That's dope. So you know it doesn't take space like this. It doesn't take a lot of hardware. You're, mm-hmm. you're paying for your okay. knowledge. That's what so, I'm saying, man. You know. Like if you're a real grinder, a real hustler, you're mm-hmm. a real worker, then you can do anything. Mm-hmm. You just need. Um, See, for so many for so many years, I worked for IBM. Oh, okay. And we had to hunt what we ate. Mm-hmm. So you hunt more, you eat more. You don't hunt, you don't eat. But you would think with a big company like that, you're sitting on a bench and they're just throwing work at you. You would no. think, yeah. But then after a while, you're like, well, if I'm out here doing all this something for them, and I'm building all these relationships, mm-hmm. you know, why don't I just build these relationships with me, you know, for me? And I 1,000% know what you're saying there. To. Then it went from that to... Um, to me out here all over the world, you know, chasing business development, you know, mm-hmm. leaving my family at home. I'm out there hunting. Then I got sick and then uh, COVID came around. And now it's like, I don't care about that stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm keeping enough work to pay some of my bills. You know, I don't care about, you know, the things that used to be important to me. I mm-hmm. just don't care about now. Like, you know, one of the things that you hear about in our environment is people talking about um, generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And to us, generational wealth means, like, you know, I want to be sure that I set myself up so my family will be well after me. So we have generations of wealth, right? And I thought that was really important. But then I realized recently, generational wealth means different things to different people. Mm Mm-hmm. Like when I was stating earlier with me having two sons and they're doing so great right now, you know, by being 30 years old, an orthopedic surgeon, 27, you know, making six figures in finance at Chase, you know, I still was able to put themselves in a position where they don't want my money. They don't Mm -hmm. want anything left over from me. Mm -hmm. You know, they're asking me, dad, what do you want? Dad, what can, you know, what can I buy you? And I'm more proud to be able to say my my son, my next generation, is so established that they're not waiting on me to to do things. They're buying artwork now. They're not going to Dubai and all this stuff like the younger generation. Mm-hmm. They're invest, investing in, in in art and stuff in like pieces, that. Yeah, that's going to add value. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like a 27. Last thing in the world I would see my Bible. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, they're not over social media. You know. Showing all the stuff that they do. They're just, if they're out there, they're posting the artwork that they're buying, the originals and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that's when I said, now that's generational wealth because their generation is doing, that generation is doing so much better than me and my brother, and we did. And they are so far along where, you know, like I said, to be a 
orthopedic surgeon, there's nothing that I could have done to get him prepared for that. I can't mm-hmm. call in somebody. I can't say, hey, make my son be a doctor too. Yeah. You know, because I was mm-hmm. a doctor, he was a doctor. Right. And one of the things that I realized was, you know, with me being in cyber and not having any um, any uh, doctors in the family, I didn't understand the hooding process. The what process? The hood. Okay. So a doctor hound can only be hooded by another doctor. Okay. So we're sitting, he graduated from Ohio State, and you see, here's Joe, um, uh, I don't know, uh, Joe Smith, or no, Joe, <laughs> Joe Smith, Dean right. or something, mm-hmm. being hooded by his mother, his grandmother. You know, then here's Bill Johnson being hooded by his mentor. So all of the African American people were basically being hooded by mentors because. They didn't have any other doctors that were close to them to give the hood them because a, a doctor could only be hooded by another doctor. Mm-hmm. But then some of the other races will see two and three generation doctors hooding each other. And I said, see, that goes to show you how far behind we are because a lot of the African Americans mm-hmm. are first now, first doctors. They don't have other doctors in their family or in their close their space to be able to hood them, to give them the opportunity to be proud enough to hood them. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, that means, you know, I'm I'm seeing other races being hooded by three generations of doctors. You know, how far along are you if you're on the third generation doctors, you know? And the other two generations graduated from Ohio State. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you talk about legacy. I mean, that's what legacy is. So Mm -hmm. those are things that I say, okay, to me, that's what generational wealth is, is being able to get that next generation in places that we... We, we never thought we'd see ourselves in. Yeah. You know, not just leaving them a bunch of, of things, but giving them the knowledge and to be able to, like they say, you give a man a fish, mm-hmm. or you teach him to fish. That's generational wealth. Yeah, I um, I agree with a lot of things that you just said. I don't disagree with mm-hmm. any of it. Um, and the only thing that I would add to it, at least when I think about generational wealth, and that's something I'm thinking about with my daughter yep. as I'm looking at my peers as they continue to have kids and so on and so forth, is that, one, I want to teach her how to like make her own career, Correct. make her own money to hustle. And so, Correct. Um, I remember when my dad met my mom, uh, and she worked at the library, and uh, my dad would always take my brother into the library Um Every Saturday, and my mom was like, "Yo, this black dad's with his son and everything. Oh, he's so dope and everything." And uh, my dad, he dropped a bar, and he was like, "You know, there's three things I could teach my son: is how to love God, how to love learning, and how to um, make money." And it's like I just want to teach him how to do these things, and then if I teach that, then I know everything else will just yep. work out. And that's how he got it. He was like, "All right, that's amazing," yep. you know. Um, yeah, and so I want to teach as well, but I think that again to add to what you're saying is I want to also give my daughter that same starting point that you know some other people in other races may have. Yes, um, yes. just be able like to make the introduction. You're right. You can't teach your kid. Well, you can't call somebody and be like, "Hey, make my kid a doctor." Yep. You know, uh, but you may be able to call somebody and say, "Hey, I need my kid to." go to this school yep. or you may be able to say, Hey, I need my kid. Um, well, I want to pay their tuition yes. so they don't have yes. to worry about yes. no like stress. anything. Yeah, exactly. No stress. And, exactly. um, and so when I'm thinking about generational wealth, I'm thinking about those things as mm-hmm. well. well. I'm grateful that you, um, chose to come and sit down, uh, with me and, um, with the more than a walk podcast. Okay. Um, this guy fish, I know we kind of just got into the conversation. Um, and that's just because when he starts talking, I've only had a couple conversations with yeah, him, but yeah. um, when he starts talking, I, I just want to listen and just soak it up. But I remember one of the things that you said uh, the last time that we talked, it was via text. And you said, you know, time is one of my most valuable assets. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was it was genuine. It was raw, authentic and everything. But it, it really just like resonated with me. It was such a basic sentence, but like, that's 100% facts. Like when you were just talking about how the things that you used to care about, you maybe don't care about yeah. so mm-hmm. much anymore. Um, and like saying, this is the most valuable thing that I have because it's something I can't get back. Can't get back. Um, it really resonated with me. It's something that like, if I were writing, you know, a list of, of uh, laws or commandments that I follow and everything, I think time and time management and time appreciation 
has to be on that. Um, I think that the reason why you have that perspective is significant, you know? Um, so the way I heard about you before I ever had a conversation mm -hmm. with you, um, you know, because of, you know, the health conditions and stuff that you have, you said that you got sick and that's kind of what made you slow down at work. Um, is that something, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I'll be happy to. So, uh, during the pandemic, like I said, you know, I was an extrovert. I was out here doing business development all over the world. I had clients in Tokyo, Paris, London, because where I specialized in was the protect, protecting of credit card information. So, um, you know, and once the pandemic shut down the, the, the country, I um, had to refocus on how to do business. And so that whole time, I was realizing that I wasn't feeling my, like my normal self, you know. Mm. Um, and with me being the extrovert in the summer of 2020, we went to Jamaica, right? <laughs> Jamaica was shut down, mm. came back with COVID, right? Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was like, man, this COVID is something. Thank God that it really didn't hit me that bad, you mm -hmm. know. You know, I kind of had this, lost my taste and, you know, the normal signs and everything. But the whole time, um, my legs were feeling funny. And I thought maybe I had this thing called, people call it like restless leg syndrome mm -hmm. and all these things. And, you know, I get up in the morning and my legs are hurt and all this. And I'm trying all types of different things. So um, to make a long story short, this goes to tell you about how how God does things for a, for at His time. I'm in Ohio Health. Um, I'm going to all these different doctors, and fortunately, my son, the orthopedic surgeon, was home, and I said, "Hey, I got this appointment for the neurologist. Get up and come with me," you know. Just like me waking up my son for the last 20 years to yeah. go to school, go to practice. So he gets up out of his bed as a child, puts on his sweatpants, puts on his hoodie, puts on the slides. We go to the doctor. Now, my son is very, um, how can I want to say, very quiet, more introvert. He does not want people to know he's a doctor. Okay. You know, he's an Air Force Academy grad who never wears his ring, you know, mm -hmm. because he just doesn't want people he doesn't want the attention mm -hmm. so we're at the neurologist and um the neurologist is asking me the certain questions because they couldn't quite figure out why my legs were hurting and the pain was going from different parts of my legs different times and um he's just like asking me this the simple question it's like come in and ask this this african-american these five questions or these eight questions that i normally ask and then i'm going to send him out so as he's asking me these questions and not really asking the questions that really needed to understand what was going on, my son started asking questions, right? And um, he got the, his hoodie on and everything. And then the, uh, the neurologist says, are you in the medical field? You know? <laughs> you sound like you know what you're talking yeah, about. You like yeah, you know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So I said, yes. He says, yes, I'm an orthopedic surgeon resident. Then the neurologist <laughs> pops up, right? Then he starts asking me all of these different questions. I started asking my son all these questions. The doctor, the, he's the, asking you different questions yes, now that he knows. That yes, he's, and he's wow, asking my son wow. these questions. And then to, it got to the point where my son had to tap out where he was like, hey, I'm just a re orthopedic surgeon resident. This yeah. is not what I do. This is what you do. You right, know? Right, right. So he wants to make sure that that now that he knows that my son is one of him. Mm -hmm. So he ordered all of these extra tests. All he would these, have never ordered otherwise. My son can sit here right now and he will still not take credit wow. for what happened. You know, because I saw the dynamics of the whole appointment change. Mm -hmm. So he ordered me all of these extra tests, right? And in the process of them doing all this extra blood work, they realized that I had a... a um, a high level of protein in my blood, right? And everybody, do, then so from there, they sent me to all these other tests. They ended up sending me to the James. And everyone was saying, why would a neurologist order all these blood tests, all this blood work? Normally a neurologist wouldn't order all this blood work. 
it's a good thing he ordered all this blood work. Oh, that guy did a great job. And I was thinking to myself, the reason why he did it is because you had your son. I had my son there, and he realized wow. that my son was was knew what he was talking about. So right then and there, I was thinking, wow, it's amazing how the healthcare system is. You know, I've always been a person that went to the doctor, always got my physicals. That you know what everyone says colonoscopy, you know, and all that stuff, PSA tech. I always did all that, and everything was fine. But I knew cancer cancer ran in my family. I mean, mm-hmm. like, cancer runs in most of the African-American family. So I knew there was a chance that I may get it because, you know. But um, so as they went through the process, them checking my, uh, my high level of protein in my blood, they ended up doing a bone marrow biopsy. And I was diagnosed with what was called a smoldering multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma is cancer of the bone marrow that a lot of African-American males, African-American people get it. And it's one of those diseases that it affects your immune system. Mm. So it affects your immune system, which can cause other illnesses to cause you to pass away. Like Colin Powell had it, you know. Mm. So a lot of people have it. They caught covid their body couldn't fight the COVID. So even though the cause of death was COVID, it was because their yeah, immune system was was yeah. compromised due to the fact that this multiple myeloma. How long had, or I don't mean to jump ahead, but like how long had you had it when you found out at that point? So at this time, we were probably three months. Okay, okay, okay. Again, because I'm stayed at the health health center. I had a son. Mm-hmm. Um I had the extra blood work. So I was blessed at my timing. Right, right, right. You know, I was blessed at my timing. So they said, okay, you have it. Your numbers are extremely low. So we're not going to kick you into chemo. We're going to monitor it. Okay. It can stay here for the rest of your life. Or it can, you know, increase and we'll kick you into chemo. So the whole time they did that, and we're talking June now. So from June to September... I just kept getting worse, kept dropping weight, had no energy, and uh, my legs were beginning to hurt more and more and more. So they put me into uh, pain management, right? And pain management, I was at that time I was taking um, oxycodones, and I was like, that was the only thing that was going giving me relief was mm. opioids. And then you have a, a son who's a doctor. And he was so worried about me being addicted to opioids, I would limit how, how I would take them. Right. But I was so in so much pain that was only that was giving me relief. So I was kind of suffering because I didn't want to take the pills to help me re- relieve the pain because everybody was so worried about me being addicted to the opioid. You see mm-hmm. all of this into, into the news. So I go to pain management doctor at the Jane, which was palliative, palliative care which is kind of the care that they give cancer patients mm-hmm. to do for like a, just the quality of life. And my doctor would say, your son's going to hate me. So the, the other thing that I forgot to mention is, every time I go to a doctor, I say, hey, my son's an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, he you graduated say that now. from Ohio State. <laughs> you saw what happened last year. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wanting, it. he's wanting you guys. So mm-hmm. I'm going to expect the same type of treatment, treatment that yeah. you will want your parents to get. So mm-hmm. I dropped that. Everywhere, my, my wife says, oh, shoot, here he goes with that <laughs> crap again, right? So um, the uh, pain management doctor was like, your son's going to hate me. Your son's going to hate me. He says, I'm going, I'm going to prescribe you um, um, a drug that, you know, that he's not going to be like. I'm going to put you on methadone. I'm like, methadone? You know, because we all hear methadone Meth- yeah. is, a, you know, it's mm-hmm. bad. She said, it's great for nerve pain and all that. And they said, but before we put you on methadone, we have to do an EKG because methadone can do something weird to your heart. I'm like, if you think that, I said, well, what happens if I get addicted? She says, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll deal with that when we get there. So right then and there, I realized, okay, this must be something serious because mm-hmm. this doctor was telling me she ain't even worried about me being addicted, become addicted to yeah to uh, opioids. So this must be some next level, next level type of thing. But you know, what I also learned on this whole process is you don't know what you don't know. Mm. So don't be upset because someone doesn't know what they don't know. And that was the reason why we had that conversation about my time, mm. and I didn't want to take it any more than that because yeah. you didn't know what you didn't know exactly. I felt about. It. 
So I use that as my one of my one of my bases in life is people don't know what they don't know, so don't mm-hmm. be upset with them, you know. So um, to get back to the story, I didn't know, I didn't know what this disease was. I didn't know what they were doing. Only I knew that I was in serious pain and I needed relief. So I'm like methadone. If you think methadone is going to work, let's do it. I'm all in. We'll deal with my son later. Um, so they go to put me in, they do the EKG and they're like, wait a minute. And they kept doing it over and over and over again. And by then I'm like, okay, what's going on? You know? Mm-hmm, yeah. They said, well, you know, your QT, your certain levels are a little high. We're going to send you to a heart specialist. And at that time that they realized that my heart was stiffening, it wasn't performing properly. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's this now? And they said, okay. The reason why it this may be happening is based off of your protein level, there's a possibility that you may have this rare disease called AL amyloidosis. What happens is the mutant protein that your bone marrow is making, your body doesn't know how to process it. So it's just it stores in your organs. And we're thinking that it's storing in your heart, which is causing your heart to stiffen. It's like saying if your heart are getting next to your uh, uh, bricks in it yeah, so yeah. it makes it harder perf- to perform and um, they said also that may have been attacked your central nervous system which is the reason why you're having your legs, problems in your legs because yeah. the nerves in your legs or so they did some more tests and it came back positive for this rare disease and again I didn't know what I didn't know I didn't mm-hmm. know how rare it was because which was the reason why I was fatigued because of my heart wasn't AFib Mm. Um, dropping weight because um, I didn't eat. And another thing that I kind of forgot was I kept complaining about this weird taste in my mouth. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, COVID. I'm like, no, this isn't COVID. Right. COVID was no taste. Mm-hmm. This is a weird taste. And mm-hmm. everybody kept saying, oh, it's COVID. And then again, I kept saying, God, don't get mad. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. COVID is so new, you know. So they're going to keep saying this is COVID, but. How do they know this? Not I was like, no, it kind of like a metal taste. It's something like yeah. different. I'm like, how can I drink water which has no taste and can still taste this weird taste? So, um, you know, so I was like, something's not right. So once they realized that I had this rare disease, they said, okay, we're going to hurry up and kick you into chemo. So I said, great. Um, and then also they said, um, based off of you being an African American. You being uh, recently diagnosed with this, there's a rare clinical trial that we may want to offer you. Do you want to participate? I said, sure. And they said, with this clinical trial, it's like uh, two-thirds receive it, one-third receives the placebo. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, sure, I'll take it. I'll, you know, whatever. I said, number one, if I get the drug and it helps me, great. If I don't get the drug, but it helps the next person, I'm okay with that too. So, you know, as an African-American, I was 110% in receiving the clinical trial. You know, a rare drug that hasn't really been tested. They don't really know what the side effects are. But there's a chance that it could help me or help the next person. Right, right, right. So I said I'm into it because, you know, African-Americans, we don't participate in many clinical trials. I mean, mm. we all know people who bought, didn't even get the COVID vaccine mm-hmm. because they're scared. Oh, they don't, I don't know what they're giving me. I don't know what it is. The Tuskegee, you know, um, test, you know, 60 years ago. So we're just, you know, mm-hmm. we have every right to have those fears. Mm-hmm. But again, I go back and you don't know what you don't know. So right. I went on and participated into it. And um, I'm happy that I did. So, what ended up happening, once I got started with the chemo, uh, my numbers got better. Uh, I got more energy, started gaining weight. I got down to like, a, I went from like 210 to 150 in like five months. And that means that you didn't have the placebo then, like you actually got the actual. Well, they still haven't came out and said. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, but you, uh, well, yeah. like, come on now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, doing, I'm doing great. You yeah. Know? I'm doing you look great. great. Mm-hmm. So everything seems to, to work. Um and it was really weird. So as I realized I was diagnosed with this rare disease, you know, now I'm like, okay, I got this team at the James. 
I got this rare disease, you know, what do I do next? So um, I have a brother who lives in Houston. He was like, you need to come down to MD Anderson. It's the best cancer hospital in the country. I'm like, okay. But again, I felt kind of a, a, yeah. a certain way because I didn't want to offend my my Your Ohio team. State James team yeah. by saying, I'm going to get a second opinion. Exactly. So, Especially because they've been taking care yeah, of you. Yeah, because they've been taking yeah, care yeah, of me yeah. and I wouldn't do it. And, and I looked at myself as being a nice guy mm -hmm. and I don't want to offend anybody, you mm -hmm. know. I'll open the door for somebody. I'll say good morning, you know, because I'm, I'm just, you know, been brought up to be a, a nice person, a gentleman, yeah, right? Got you. Not, mm -hmm. not offend people. But this was my health, right? right? And I have mm -hmm. to advocate for my own health. Exactly. Because yeah. if I don't advocate for my own health, nobody will, mm -hmm. you know? And imagine, you know, if, I mean, even the first doctor, they um, did all those tests and everything. Like They even gave you a second opinion, even in that moment yep. after your son started yep. talking. It's like, this is different than yep. what you were saying just a couple minutes ago. Yep. So, I mean, it's healthy. Dude. Yeah, you it. just got to, you got to learn how to pivot. Mm -hmm. You got to, if you can't pivot in life, you will not be successful. That's facts. Life is all about being able to pivot, especially as an African-American man. And as a man in this in this country, you got to learn how to pivot. So um, what ended up happening was I go down to Houston, get a second opinion. They agree with everything that um the James had. You know, one of these things that I realized with me being in technology, now all of these systems have um some type of epic uh um program where they can share test results they can mm. share appointments they can i can log it's like in a network almost i can log in on an app on my phone and see my appointments see my test results see my blood work i can track everything so you know i'm able to look at my test results and that's one of the things that my son would always say is dad don't the don't go out there and start googling all your test results because the the information is there but you do not know how to process the information. Mm. Did you agree with that or disagree with that? Both. Okay. Because I would say, okay, I got 25 blood results right here in front of me, test results right here in front of me, right? And I can see of the 25, three of them were through the roof. Oh, I'm dying. Oh, these one here says if you're over 72.6, you're whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm at 84. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm only focusing on the things that were like high, high mm -hmm. or low, gotcha. and not focusing on everything because right. I don't know how they all correspond with each other. Mm -hmm. So he says, you know, if you got three that's bad and twenty are good, you're great. Because if the three were bad and you had a particular type of cancer, something you would have had all these other ones would have been bad, but they're good. But I would never know that. Mm -hmm. So that's why you just don't focus on the numbers. You got to understand you how the all the numbers works together. Works stuff. together. So gotcha. that's why you just can't go out there and start googling it. Yeah. And because you're not trained to know how exactly everything works together. So I had to, I had to learn that is sometimes it's not always the numbers; it's how you feel. Mm -hmm. So as I was advocating for my own health, because I had to say to myself, you know, I got a great team. I got a son who who knows more than the next man does. You know, I got a great wife, you know, um, who's, you know, supporting me. But if I can't take care of my, myself, I'm no good to no one. Right. I'm no good to my business partners. I'm no good to my, my wife. I'm no good to my kids. I'm no good to my brother. I'm no good to my friends. I'm no good to anyone. So I have to take care of myself first. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know how it is having a young child. You know, sometimes life, it's so funny to say, you know, life comes at you hard. And life is difficult. So you're Tell saying, okay, it. I got to get my kids to football practice, basketball practice, and all this. She needs these shoes. They need these piano lessons. My wife needs this. Yep. As a man, it's my responsibility to do all this. Got to pay for tuition, child yep. care. You know, but if you're doing all that, sometimes you may put yourself Second, yeah, you know, okay, I won't go to the doctor or I won't buy this medication or I won't get the sleep test even though I'm snoring or I got sleep apnea and everything. You know, why do I snore so much? I'll yeah. come, I'm sitting here talking to people and then I'm, I'm, I'm asleep, but I'm not really asleep, you know. 
if you don't take care of yourself, you're no good too. You know, and I think that that's like an important conversation that similar to how we were talking about generational wealth, mm -hmm. um, there are lessons that get passed down, you know, from generation to generation. Yeah, like exactly. For the longest, when I was growing up, you know, um, the, the lesson was like being a man, like, you yeah. know, you're the provider yeah. for you. You're the one that maintains security. Yeah. And you make sure that there's safety. You make sure that there's food at the crib, that yeah. there is a crib to go home yeah. to. Um you know, so on and so forth. Then you start to introduce other things like the emotional um, mm -hmm. security as well. As like yeah. Make sure that you um, you see the importance of like their feelings, make sure that they're heard and that, um, you know, they feel secure in their identity, their self-esteem and all that type of thing. Like those are the conversations that's added. Um, but what you're talking about, or at least what I think that you're going to, um, it's a concept we talk about here at the agency about like wellness as a lifestyle yes. and about how, you know, you have to take care of your yourself as well, um, so that you can be present for your exactly. family, so you can be present exactly. for yourself. And exactly. um, that starts young, and it's something you have to keep on practicing. You mm -hmm. have to keep on mm -hmm. like relearning. Mm -hmm. It's almost like uh, working in IT and getting recertifications. Yeah. Like, so yeah. I mean, it makes sense to sacrifice your needs and wants for your family. Not like you said, as a man, mm -hmm. that's that's what we do. And sometimes, you know. It's so, society is so crazy now where people get credit for taking care of their kids. Yeah. It's and the way work. we came up was that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Don't give me credit for doing what I'm supposed to do. Right. Um, babysitting my kids. It was so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Babysit yeah. your kids. Yeah, you know, I was at the barbershop last, last week. Brother said, yeah, 15 kids. Oh, wow. And he said, I take care of my kids. And my process is I had two. And surgeons, college degrees, and, you know, doing great. And I wish I could turn the clock back. Because mm -hmm. there's so many things that I would have done differently mm -hmm. to make them better people. Yeah, yeah. Like, out here chasing that money was, was good, but I couldn't be in two places. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, how can you take care of 15 kids? Yeah. I didn't even know how many households were around 15 kids. Right, right. You know, if, like, when, like some of the kids would have you know, 10, 12 kids in one family. So they all were coming up within the same morals, you know, mm -hmm. the same structure, the same foundation, right or wrong. But when you have 15 kids in different households, how can you take care of 15? Taking care of a kid means more than just paying monthly yeah. for them. At the agency, we talk about the um, fatherhood initiative. The reason why we had the Proud Dad Pledge, which talks about making sure that your kids in a good daycare, that you're going to read and ride with them, teaching them ABCs, count to 20, mm -hmm. um, go outside and play with them. It's because we're just trying to encourage a community of active fathers because we know that when dads are active and involved in their kids' yes. lives, that you know they have a higher chance of graduating yes. from high school. They have a lower chance of having a teenage pregnancy. They have a lower chance of getting incarcerated. They yep. have a higher chance of going to college. And all that. There's something about just being present like yes. I, I loved what you said again about the time and that's the most valuable asset I, I like to say to people all the time like money is not the only type no, of currency no, that's out there no like sometimes your presence really yeah. is a currency and that's something that nobody else can even give to you and like, I like you, how you put that because you hear I take care of my more than you hear I'm active in my kids mm -hmm. you know and that's yeah. something they're like it should go hand in hand they but should. we don't we don't, you know, you hear fathers talk about, I take care, I take care, I take care. My kids need for nothing. Mm -hmm. They need for your time. Right. And if you got 15 of them, how can you give 15 kids your time? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So, but, you know, I like I said, I'm all over the place. But yeah, it's all good. that was the reason why I say to myself, okay, I have to take care of myself to be able to be a good provider. And, you know, as your kids get older... The needs and wants are different. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, when my kids were little, I had a huge life insurance policy mm. because they needed me to be there. The house needed to be paid for. Their education needed to be taken care of. They needed all that. But then as I got older and they became their own men, my needs after I passed was different than That's now because... All I need to make sure is my wife is taken care of, the house is paid off. I don't have to worry about about education, my kids, and all that stuff and their needs at once. So, like I said, you have to have a good plan in your life to see how you adjust certain things as you're 
get older because your needs and wants change. That's a perspective I have never heard before. You like, know? you know, we hear often, like, get a life insurance yeah. so that, you know, pass down generational wealth yeah. like we was talking about. Um, but I, I guess, I mean, it makes sense it makes what you're sense. saying, but I just never you thought about, about like, one. you know, pivoting, yep. you know, like I said, as, pivot. yeah, your your needs now having a four year old and a 24 year old should be it's different. different. Exactly. And maybe use your assets differently yep. for different needs. Yep. No, that's so really it was so weird because, you know, we came to the point where, um, we told our kids after I got sick, you know. Hey, we need to put some, y'all need to put some extra life insurance on your mama. <laughs> you know, y'all can't put nothing extra on me. I got what I got, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. But every dime that we got, we going to spend it. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, spend it. We don't want your money. Mm. Spend your Enjoy money. Enjoy your life. Enjoy yeah. your life now. Put the extra life insurance on your mama. Because, unfortunately, we all are going to pass. Right. It's and inevitable. that's 100% a return on your dollar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, yeah, yeah. you know, and if you want some some generational wealth, that wealth is going to be <laughs> the life insurance that you put on your mama because when she gone, then you cash, you get that, that policy going to cash it, get it now while it's going to, because well, nobody insure me. Right, right. Because right. right? I'm going to spend, like, I'm going to spend all my, all the little nickels and fuse I got. There's going to be nothing left for y'all. Right, right, if right. If something's left to be given to y'all, I did something wrong. Right. That makes sense. You know, so put the life insurance on your mama. And then when she passes, which is going to happen, maybe hopefully 20 years from now or whatever, the whole term policies that you put on her will be a return on your investment. And it's going to pay well. Um, I want to go back a little bit to what you you had said something about um, how your son told you to go about researching your numbers mm -hmm. here at the agency we talk a lot about knowing your numbers mm -hmm. and um it, you know the quiet part is like that is just the start of it yes. you know we walk every year to raise awareness yes. about the fact that black men die on average 12 years earlier than our white counterparts but that's not the complete solution no, no. you know we we want people to come down we give out the free health screenings we connect them with uh medical professionals so on and so forth but that really is just the the start of the journey because once you get the numbers then there's an action that you have to do with those numbers and, and stuff that's too. what i made mean, that's what i loved about the walk so much and i appreciated it after i was ill even more than before i was ill was the, the pre-screening the pre-screening meant a lot. And I realized, you know, if you don't know your numbers, how are you going to know when something's off? Mm -hmm. You know, so as an African-American, as any man, know what your normal weight is, you know? Know what your blood pressure normally is, you know? Know if know what your sugar number, your diabetes numbers are. You know, some of the things, because not so much that you need to be a doctor to understand it, but you need to be able to know when it's off. You know, like I said, I was dropping weight like crazy, right? And I say, okay, number one, I'm not eating, which is the reason why I'm dropping weight, you know. Uh, my blood pressure is normally this, you know. Um, yeah, my blood pressure normally was a little, before and I had to wait, was a little high. You know, high, they call it hypertension, mm -hmm. you know, to the point where they always want to prescribe me blood pressure medication, but it wasn't really high enough to take blood pressure medication. Yeah, you know? I've been there. So I wonder, okay, is it part of the American way where everybody needs to get on this blood pressure medication? Mm -hmm. It has other side effects, which also could be part of the reason why my blood pressure is a little high is because my appointment's at 10. There's a drug rep that went in there at 10. You know, he has coffee and donuts. Mm -hmm. you, you know when a... You know when a drug rep is in the office compared to a patient. Because I'm a people person. I watch the room, right? Wow. He's carrying donuts. He's carrying a big briefcase. Who brings a big briefcase? And in? that's going to elevate when they're doing the screening and everything. But because yeah, you just I'm, got I'm mad with because now my 10 o'clock appointment is 1030 because he had to do his pitch yeah. to the doctor. So now mm -hmm. my blood pressure is my time. Exactly, your my time, time is valuable. My time. Yeah, so yeah, now yeah. that he goes in before me, I'm upset. 
you know, so now I'm very precious, but he has to do his thing and give the samples out and do all this stuff because that's the healthcare system. Right, right, right. So, you know, the first thing that they ever do is when they, even when my keep my babies was at the pediatrician, y'all got any samples? Y'all got any samples? Y'all got any samples? <laughs> Because yeah. I know how the system works. They come right. in there, they drop samples because they want the doctor to write the scripts for that particular medication. Right, nah. You know, it, it's a circle. It's like it they is. said, it's guns and butter. Mm -hmm. You know, one pays for the other, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that we just need more people in our community to kind of cut through that and to like explain like how this works. Yeah, and this, like, it's kind of how it works, you know. Did. So now I'm in there, I'm upset. So my pressure's a little high. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I was going with that is by me knowing my, trying to know my numbers, I know when something's different. Mm -hmm. Like um, as I was sick, they put me on a, um, I go into my, 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 uh, my cardiologist and I'm like, Okay, if we know that my heart's going to decline, what can we do to make it to stop the decline? Why right. do we have to wait till it get bad to do something? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. my 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 mind process is being in cyber. Let's block it now instead right. of waiting for it to happen. And exactly. Yeah. Let's be active instead of reactive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my mind thing. Let's be active. So they put me on a beta blocker, and when they put me on a beta blocker, I started gaining weight. Mm. Right, and everybody was like, "Good," because. You know, you drop so much weight, so much, yeah. you need to gain weight. Good, good. I'm like, but it's bad because I haven't changed my intake. Mm. So if I haven't changed how I'm eating, why am I? Why am I gaining weight? Right. And that was the question I was asking everybody. Did you get any good answers? I was called holding water weight. So what happened was, I'm in the shower, I look at my feet, and I'm like, it's swollen. Yeah, I'm like, when when did I get Barney Rubble feet? You know what I mean? Because I'm used to seeing what veins and stuff is in my skinny feet. Mm -hmm. My feet were swollen. They said, "Yep, you're you're retaining water mm -hmm. cause of that medication." Is that a problem? It was a problem. Okay. You know, because no one wants to retain water because number one, your kidneys aren't working right. Fine. Got you. Because okay. you're not passing the what needs to. So they realized it was the beta blocker. They took me off the medication. I dropped twenty pounds in thirty days. Mm -hmm. Because I was holding, I was holding water. Yeah, so water again, yeah. knowing your body, knowing your numbers, no mm -hmm. one knows your body better than you do. Mm -hmm. Somebody at a walk that we had down in Houston, um, excuse me, they said that I know everything about my car. I know when I need to get new tires. Yep. I know yep. when I need to get an oil change. Yep, I, I mean, know like, when the wheel is yeah, shaking. Wheel I know is, when it's pulling to the left. Exactly. 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 But I'm not taking that same Initiative. level of maintenance yep. of my body. Exactly. How does that make sense? Exactly. Exactly. And you exactly. said that you've been to the walk before. Yep. So I know a yep. lot of people, like the walk is their um, annual, mm -hmm. like, you know, checking their numbers and everything. I know it's like, that's when I go to go do it. You know, and obviously we encourage people to have like a primary care physician. Um, but at the very least, we do want you to know what your numbers are from year in to year out. Exactly. How long have you been going to the walk? Uh, probably about four years. Mm -hmm. I've been to four walks probably over maybe six, eight years. Okay, so we've frame. probably been at a couple of walks yeah. together then. Yep. So the thing is, like I always say also that I've been telling everybody is, in life, it's not how you start. mm it's how you end. What do you mean by that? So if you go to college mm -hmm. and it takes you eight years to get out, mm -hmm. who cares? At facts. the end, you got your degree. That's facts. You know, if you start by going to a walk and that's the only way that you can get your numbers, that's fine. But what do you do with that? Do you get a primary care doctor at the end of this? Mm -hmm. Now you're at a doctor and you're and he's checking you and he found out something. Or the walk is how you realize that your diabetes numbers were high. Mm -hmm. Who cares at the beginning? It's how you end it. It's what did you do with it? It's how did you get to the end of whatever journey you was? Mm -hmm. It's not about the first step. It's about the last step. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So yes. I tell people all the time is, the ER is not your doctor. Right. Oh, my God. Say that again. <laughs> you know, people go to the ER for stuff that, that they shouldn't go to the ER. I have a headache today. Yeah. Or, you know, this and that because they don't have a primary care. Yeah. And, and, and it's so weird because I get so upset. I get so upset at my medical team at the James because I have cardiologist i have one about the 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 way that the heart 
works, and then I have another one for the electrical part of the heart, which are two different parts of the heart. Mm. One's the muscle, other is the electrical part. Mm. So that's two different specialists, right? I have a, a pain doctor. I have a nutritionist. I have a cancer doctor. I have, you know, all these different teams. But my main problem is my was my nerve problem was mm-hmm. the, neuro, the, the, the neurologist, and I get mad at him. I say I don't have a neurologist. <laughs> they said, Mister Fish, you don't have a neurologist? No, I don't have one. And they they look at me all crazy, and they go to the computer. Your neurologist is so. I'm like, no, I don't. If I don't know that guy when he walks in, and he don't know me, and I don't have a relationship with him, I don't have him. Mm, I see that person saying. that you pulled up on the computer can walk in here to, and this I don't know name. who he is Yeah, I don't have one just because I have one in the computer to me I don't have it right. if I don't have a relationship with that person I don't have one and they said Mr. Fisher you're right so who do you say is like responsible for maintaining that relationship me and them. it's both of us yeah. mm-hmm. it's, it's me because I'm complaining well, you're scheduled to have an appointment with one in six months. What's wrong? How you doing? I'm upset. Why? I don't have a neurologist. <laughs> They're like, oh, here he goes. With this <laughs> here he goes. With yeah. it. But it's the truth. But if you don't say that, though, then like they I can't gotta go. I got to advocate but, for my own What did you say? Health. People don't know what they don't they know. They don't know what they don't know. Mm-hmm. And so you let them know. I let them know I'm over not okay and with over. This, you know? if, I, if I don't know who the guy is, I don't have one. Yeah, I like that. If I don't know who my doctor is and I got to go to the ER, I don't have one. Mm. If I don't have a relationship with, with my primary care that I go to every year, I don't have one. Mm. You may have a relationship with the guy at McDonald's. You may have a relationship with the guy who washes your car. You may have a relationship with the, the, the guy at the kid's school, mm-hmm. but you don't have a relationship with your doctor. Right, here's one for you. You have a relationship with... Um, the bartenders yep. or with the people that throw parties the yep. promoters yep. And you, you know you have rela- you, you do have relationships with people that you frequent or yep. that you know yep. you want to make sure that you know like yep. oh you know what my special is like yep. take care of me type yep. thing it's the same thing I, I never looked at it that yep. way I tell him all the time if I don't know who that guy is and he don't know me I don't have one mm, just because true. the computer says I have one I don't know who that guy is. So how is he my guy if I don't know who he is? Mm-hmm. He's not invested in me. I'm just a, a na- I'm a exactly. name on his computer the same way he's a name exactly. on Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm his 10 o'clock. I'm his 4 o'clock. Mm-hmm. You know? And I realized that, that I wouldn't got the service that I get if I didn't have the relationships. My brother says, oh, you get such great care because of your... I say, no, it's because I'm an extrovert. I make sure people know who I am, mm-hmm. and I make sure that I know who they are. I build relationships with everyone. Man, listen, after the first conversation I had with you, I will never forget you. You, see yeah, what I'm you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, and, and, they, they look, and some of the doctors says, I saw how bad you was hurting, and I wanted to help you. Re- I wanted to relieve your pain. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go to extra and beyond. And they know that, all right, guys, get an MRI today. He's going to see these numbers. He's going to go into the my chart. He's going to be firing off all these emails. <laughs> Let's get ready. So, oh, it's really great because my care is so great because I can get an MRI. And I know this doesn't apply to everyone. And everyone's not how you start. It's how you finish. How you finish, right. Right. And I can, I'll can i be on a call with my doctors. It's 530 at night because I know that I'm going to be asking 50 million questions why my numbers are looking the way they and truthfully like that is their job like to it's their job to take care of you as a person as yep. an individual not it's not just to a, see you during your appointments it's, yep. they're supposed to be knowing yep. like all right how are their numbers trending and yep. what can they do are they t- like that is yep. their, it's almost like a coach yep exactly but exactly. for your health my cardiologist says guy it's not the numbers it's how you feel mm-hmm. how do you feel but i don't know what i don't know I don't know what this disease does. So there's two things, man. I don't know which way to go with it. Yeah, that's what I said. It's all let about- me uh, go back a little bit to something you said um, a little bit ago about the clinical trials. And you said that black people don't participate in trials. Um, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking, you were telling me about how you would go inside and you would just see the people coming in and out. See? And you never saw any black people. See, that's that's the out. weird thing. So, So when I go up on the fifth floor, is where most of the people are are going for their appointments, their chemotherapy, you know, 
their radiation, their maintenance. Maintenance means either you're getting a service or you're seeing your doctor or you're getting the first diagnosis and all that. So what I'm noticing is on the fifth floor, we are while people are walking in, they're walking out. They go on to the first floor to get the little hand band. They go up on the fifth floor. I'm on the elevator with them. I'm knowing the people who register and all of them people were walking out. And I'm sitting there and it's a whole room full of people. A whole room full of people. 40, 50 people getting all types of different services waiting to be called back. And I look around, there's no African Americans. Mm. And I'm like, wow, is it because we don't have can we don't get cancer? You know? Is it because we're not at the phase where we're walking in, getting our treatment or our services or seeing our doctors and walking out? You know, is it because we're not in a maintenance mode? Mm. You know, is it to the point where and I, some days I go in there and I get so upset because I watched that whole building get new, built that new wing. You know, I remember there was nothing because mm -hmm. I've been going so long. You know, and then some days, you know. <laughs> it's like, I'm a regular. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a regular. And and my, my cancer doctor says, you do not want to be a regular here. You know, this is not the place that you want to know anybody. You do not want to be. And I was like, wow, I never thought about that. Mm. You know, because my thing was, hey, Joe, hey, Bob. Yeah. You know, this is my know norm. This names. is my norm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be a norm here. Right. Your norm here is because you're, you're ill. Mm. And I was like, wow, I never thought of it like that. I don't know what I don't know, yeah, right? Yeah. So um, I'm looking around on the fifth floor, and I say, man, there's, like, there's no African Americans in line to get registered. There's none of us up here on the fifth floor. There's none of us coming for a clinical trial. There's none of us coming for chemotherapy or radiation here or another. Seeing doctors, so there's none of us. And I'm like, it's because we don't walk in and we don't walk out. Mm. And normally when we're down here, we're so sick. I had a, a close friend of mine just turned 53 last week. I got a call. Hey, he's dead to James. I didn't know he had cancer. If I knew he had cancer, we would have talked. He's on life support. Really? And I'm, I'm getting a call on Wednesday. It's like 930. I'm in my bed clothes saying I got to be at the James tomorrow at 8. So I'm already in my mode for my clinical trial yeah. treatment in my, in my chemo. So I'm like, okay, do I wait in the morning, go early, go up and see him and hope and pray that he's still there? Or do I get up out the bed and go now? Mm -hmm. I get up out the bed. My wife says, well, why don't you just pack your clothes and stay down there? I'm like, <laughs> no, but I got to go see him. Yeah. I get down there about 1030. He's already good pass. Man. But at least I was able to go in there while he was there, mm. pray pray with him, pray for him. Touch, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I wish he was, even though he was probably already gone, but the machine was breathing for him. Yeah. Mm. You know, and it, it meant so much. I was so sad and so happy because, you know, I was on a, I was on the 10th floor. I'd never been on the 10th floor. Right. I'm always on the 5th floor. Mm -hmm. And I saw how sick he was. I see the people's energy on that floor. Because all of their loved ones they are, are in really bad shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a whole different vibe, a whole different energy up there. And, you know, so I leave there about 12, 30, and I'm back there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I'm so sad because I'm like, I'm sad because my close friend of mine just passed. But I'm so happy because I'm walking in and I'm walking You're out. You're walking out, right. Because you caught yours early and everything. And... I think and just, with the maintenance, oh my sorry, God. the maintenance of being able to take care of myself. So it's not how I start; it's how I end. And I, I think that maintenance is really the right word to use in this case, um, because, like, let's say for example, I'm I'm really tech savvy. I'm no cybersecurity yeah, yeah, expert. We all got our pluses savvy. and our minuses. Yep. Um, and I remember I was talking to somebody that said that they were tech savvy as well, and um, so I was showing them something on my computer. And they were like, oh, I don't know how to use Max and everything. I was like, I thought you was tech savvy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then so now I'm looking down on them. But then I'm like, well, if you put out like a Linux device or you put out um, something, a Raspberry yeah, device, I don't same. know how to use yeah. that right there. It's all the same technology. And it's like, if you're not working with something, if you're not, you know, you know using it, 
then you don't have the knowledge. You don't know how to like provide solutions and stuff for it. Somebody called me and they asked me, how do I do this on it? If I have that computer, I could walk them through it without mm -hmm. even having it in front mm -hmm. of me. Like I can mm -hmm. just tell them, just do this, do this, mm -hmm. do this. And the, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because when we're talking about clinical trials, when we're talking about participating in research, we're talking about all of those things, we're, we're saying that black people are not participating in it and so the solutions that they're coming up with, the medicines that they're coming up with, they're not applicable to us because exactly. the people that are doing the research and doing the work, they're not working with us. Exactly. And so, you know, that is incumbent on us, I think, to be more willing yep. to, you know, claim our space yep. in the medical field and medical research. And, and it's like you said, if I get the solutions and everything that I need, you know, obviously that's great. If my participation helps somebody else, that's also great. Helps it is us, it's yes. a community. Yes. Like that's what like black on black healing is. Yep. It's really all of us collectively working to improve the health and wellness in our community. Yep. And um maintenance, I, I like that word because it applies in more than one realm. We mm -hmm. already talked about fatherhood. We've been talking about physical wealth, uh physical health, excuse me. We've talked about financial health. These are all different things that you have to practice on a day-to-day -day type yep. basis. But I think the one, and I'm glad because it's, it's becoming more of a mainstream conversation. It's something that we talk about in our houses. It's not taboo to talk about anymore, but mm -hmm. like mental health. And that is something that also I feel like we need to be doing regular maintenance on. We need to be checking in with ourselves, doing preventative care rather than reactive care. Exactly. Yeah. So again, it goes back to my two new roles is People don't know what they don't know. Mm. And it's not how you start. Mm -hmm. It's how you end. How you end. Right. How did so, you... So again, like I said, life, you know, certain races, we're all running a 100-yard dash, right? Mm -hmm. Some races is running a 100-yard dash with a 10-yard 10, 10 lead, you yeah, know? Start, yeah. Other races are running it from the 100. Some are running from 110, 120. Mm -hmm. We all chasing the same goal. Mm -hmm. We're all going to, most of us are going to get there, but it's not how you start. You know, the Wolfs and the Schottensteins will always be starting from ahead of us because exactly. they got a legacy. The Trumps will always, Trump said, my daddy gave me five million that I paid back in 1972. <sighs> that guy. I paid it back. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, it, it's weird. And, um, you know, I have a great story, a great, great story. And this has happened last week. So my wife had ankle replacement surgery, and she's been going through the ringer, you know. Mm -hmm. Have a son who's an orthopedic surgeon, you know, so he's in communication with the doctor. You know, I get mad at him because I think he can spend more time taking care of his mother's care. You know what I mean? It's yeah. your mom, you know. I don't care you got a life. Yeah. Your mom come before your life, you know, yeah. and all this stuff. But um, long story short, so I'm in there and I'm working with my computer and she's in surgery. And this white gentleman walks out with this, make it with this Trump hat, Trump shirt on, right? Make America great. He's my president and all this stuff. And I look at this gentleman i'm like oh my god <laughs> he walks up on me says can i pray for you i say sure right he prays for me and everything i, I thank you for praying for me and um he says well what you're in here for right i tell him and i say uh, okay you know god put me here so I, I got so much going on in my head so the one thing that to just before that to, to share the story I got very depressed mm. because I was extremely sick, right? And we fought this illness. I mean, we rolled up our sleeves, me and my family, me and my wife, me and my kids, me and my friends, you know, and we all fought this disease. And I, I'm beating it, you know. So then I said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? You put me on this earth. You gave me, you gave, I thought you gave me this disease for a reason. Do you want me to get out and tell my story? Do you want me to put work in and just go out here and tell my story? Do you want me to just do one big social media post like people do? Tell, mm -hmm. You know, I haven't posted any of my struggles. On oh, social. you haven't? No, I haven't. Oh, wow. You know, I don't, I don't know what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. And I got very depressed because I didn't know what he wanted me to do. 
And I have so many people that love me that I got all of my friends together who done certain things for me. And we had a breakfast. And there was like 12 of us. You know, because I just wanted to thank them and show them the love and everything of all the support they gave me over, you know, over the last year of my illness. And it was so funny because, you know, half of them gave, gave me money. You know, mm. some of them, just, I borrowed. I was like, okay, everybody at the table, raise your hand who gave me money. Right. <laughs> I said, that way I know who to ask and who not to ask, <laughs> you know. So it was just that type of vibe yeah. that, mm. you know, that we had. And I'm telling them my story about me being depressed because God gave me this for a reason. And I could not figure out why he gave me this terrible disease. And what did he want me to do? And one of my closest friends says, Guy, God never gave you this disease. Life gave you this disease. God would never give you anything like this. You wouldn't give this to your kids. You wouldn't give this to your wife. You wouldn't give this to anyone. So why in the world do you think God gave this to you? Mm. And once he said, they said, God is here to help you deal with it and relieve you from this. I was like, wow, that is so deep. I've been so upset and depressed trying to figure out what does God want me to do with this? Mm -hmm. Instead of just coming to him to give for relief, that thank him or help me through the tomorrow's struggle. Mm. I'm trying to figure out what did he want, why did he give this to me? What did he want me to do? Not that he gave it to me in a bad way, but he gave it to me for me to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what he wanted me to do with it. What do you feel like it is now? Pardon? I said, what do you feel like it is? Dave? Well, he never gave it to me. Life gave it to me. Oh, I'm saying that. But oh. now I'm here to mm. advocate advocacy mm. for men's health. Mm -hmm. African-American men. Not just African-American men's health. And that's the reason why this Trump story was, it was so weird. So this gentleman walks up to me, can I pray for you? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm looking at him, you know, he's five, five maybe, 280, 300 pounds. So he doesn't know he's taking care of himself. And um, I tell him my wife's ankle. I asked him, he was here for, he said his wife is on dialysis. And she needed a pick line in her arm there, putting it in there so she can get her dialysis three times a week and everything. So long story short, I asked him, well, what are you, you know, how are, what's wrong with you? you know, how are you doing? Advocating for men's health, which normally black men, but I'm sitting looking at this. He says, well, they told me I have diabetes, but I'm not going to receive it. I'm praying that, that, that the Lord will heal me from it. And I'm like, okay, but you're here for your wife getting diabetes. And I asked him, so why would the Lord heal you and not her? Mm. Because you're going through dialysis with her now. You know, that's a good point. And you're walking around praying for everybody else. <laughs> you might want to start praying for yourself and for yeah, your wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a point there. And I asked him about his kids. All oh, my kids are worth the crap and this, this, and that, you know. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so, you know, I know, and I told him my struggle. And he couldn't believe everything I went through and how well I was looking. And I told him my struggle. And I said, you know, I hate to say this, but them Republicans and Trump and everybody, they don't care about you. The only person that cares about you is that woman that you're out here for her surgery, praying for everybody else, mm. instead of sitting there praying for her. Mm. I said, you need to, I said, and look at you, you're not the healthiest. So if you're in the bed next to her getting, getting, getting dialysis, who's going to take care of y'all? Right. You need to take care of yourself. You need to get on exercise. You need to change your diet. And he was like, wow, you know what? You're right. You're right. I haven't thought of it like that. If you're not here to take care of yourself, and you're out here talking about all this stuff with Trump, he's not here with you and mm -hmm. your wife. He's not here when you go to the gas station and to the to the grocery store and stuff is so high, are you taking your wife back and forth to dialysis? Yeah. I never thought of it like that. And, you know. I think that. But that's what I said. I mm -hmm. overlooked the craziness. That, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The craziness that he had on. And I thought that this is the reason why what God wants me to do is to 
advocate for men's health, take care of ourselves, take care of each other. The operative word right there is advocacy. Yeah. And uh, again, like I know I'm probably sound like a broken record at the point. Uh, so do I. But it, it's about it's awareness and, and talking about these things and and making sure that they're introduced into the public conversation mm -hmm. and that it's introduced in our communities and that we talk about things that we haven't talked about before. Um, because like you said, it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. And um, it doesn't matter where you hear it the first time, whether it's on one of our commercials, exactly. whether it's on this podcast, exactly. whether it's a hot cart. You know, you see black men die on average 12 years earlier mm -hmm. than their white counterparts. I was shocked when I first heard yeah. that stat. The numbers and are then different. I thought about my daddy died um, two weeks ago, six years ago and everything. And, Sorry to I, hear that. Yeah, you know, like you mm -hmm. said, we all are going to die eventually. Yep. But it's just thinking, you know, one of the questions I've been asked around the agency is like, yo, what is 12 more years of a black man's life oh, worth? I mean, every, you know, everything, everything, everything. And, you know, when my dad, he, he fell into that, that average statistic mm -hmm. and everything in terms of like, oh, they died at this age. Like that's around the age that he died yeah. at. Mine too. And, and Mine then also. I come here, I start working here and they say, yo, but they don't have to. Mm -mm. And I was like, oh, all right. He messed me up with that one. What do you mean they don't have to? And I was like, well, they can not die by just doing simple things like knowing your numbers and then doing something with those numbers yeah. by um, practicing wellness as a lifestyle, by being active and present in their kids' lives, by um, increasing their financial literacy, by taking care of their mental health, like understanding it's okay to not be okay, um, mm -hmm. to work through your feelings instead of suppressing them, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so advocacy, I, I really like that word. Advocacy, maintenance, awareness, time, like those are the things that we keep it's on talking about. Everything. And that's because it's, it really is everything, mm -hmm. like you said. So, um, no, guy, I really I appreciate you um, sitting on the couch and, and like sharing these stories. Um, I know I, I told you this before, uh, but I want to reiterate that like a lot of the things that you say, they really resonate with me, um, especially like you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, having grace for people. Yes. And so even when they're acting in a way that is... Um, not in line to your exactly your beliefs that's a lot better than what i was going to yeah. say so you know yeah. um you know having grace and, and the patience because like you said it is on us for as much time as we have here on this earth to like care about the man that's next to us and and to say like you know your well-being is important for the community because mm -hmm. we are all connected yep. and interdependent um, in that way so, so uh, thank you one for last sharing. thing that I'm gonna, go we're going to talk about a little bit again I want to spend more time on is mental health mm -hmm. and I touched on it so I had one lifestyle you know uh, company prosperity out here you know making money all over the world you know doing things you know flying here flying there taking my wife doing great trips you know being able to pro uh, uh, provide for my family and everything and then once I got ill, some of that stuff I wasn't doing anymore. I was a, I'm a different person now. Mm. I don't know what I don't know. And now that I'm a different person, it makes it made me sad. You know, I can't I don't run up and down. I you know, I just got to move differently now. My life is different and um you know, it was so it was so crazy like for instance, my son was a surgeon I shouldn't say this. <laughs> had to borrow some money from his brother. Mm -hmm. I got upset because I'm the person that they should he should have came to. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was no big money or nothing. It was something small, you know, and it bothered me the most because I'm used to being the one. Whenever you have any, you come to me. But and they thought, well, dad is whatever going through his medical, whatever. We're not even going to stress him. They went to each other. So one way I should be happy because they have each other to go. They're to. moving between each other. But I got sad because that's my job. Yeah. You know, and you have to be a father, I think, to really understand that. Mm -hmm. And I was, everybody was like, "Why well, you did good?" Because they worked it. Yeah, but that's not the point. Right. The point is, they should always come to dad. That's what my job is. Mm. 
So what did you do with that life building? I just had to I just had to process it and mm. just say, you know, that's where they're at now. They're not going to come to dad like they used to because they know dad got his own stuff, his own struggles that he's dealing with. But again, I had to get over it. But, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, so when I realized that, you know, I was dealing with some depression, you know, when you're going through something like this, it causes stress on your wife. And I said to my wife, you know, I'm being hard on her and everything because, you know, my moods and everything. You take out who, who loves you the most. And I said, I only know the person of having this disease. I don't know what it's like to be married to the person that has mm. this disease or being a caregiver to the person with the disease. So I need to think about others and not take all of my anger and frustration and stuff out on her because she's going through a lot also not knowing, you know, one time they gave me six months to live and she cried. And I didn't, I never received it, you know, but because I don't know what it's like to be the son of a person. I don't know what it's like to be the friend of a person. Yeah. I only know how it is to be the, and I told the doctors, I said to the doctors, you know, all you guys are doing is trying to make my walk easier. You never walked in my shoes. You walk beside me, but you guys have not walked in my shoes. So it was a little sense of depression going on there. So I told the James, I need a counselor who specializes in cancer. Don't give me this, the next person up. Right. I need somebody to see this. You know, what I'm, know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I moved on to, I'm on the third counselor because I didn't connect with the first two. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this person's not helping me. Give me somebody else. Mr. Fisher, you want some? Yes, yes. If I don't feel like this person understands me when I'm dealing with, how are they going to help me? So again, advocating for your health making sure that you are comfortable saying this isn't working with me. I need somebody else. Yeah. You know, I told one neurologist, you had the worst bedside manners. My wife was just like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to deal with you. You know, if I'm not happy being here or comfortable while you are talking to me, I need somebody else. Yeah. And we have that power. It's our health. Don't take no seconds. Don't take no shorts. Don't walk out there saying, well, I should have said. Right. Don't leave nothing unsaid. Don't leave nothing unsaid or undone. Mm -hmm. It's not how you start. It's about how you finish. How you finish. Well, I want to take this time to uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to sit in here and spending my time talking with you guys. Like I said, I participated with the walk. Uh, plenty of times, the 2022 walk, when we went through and I talked to the doctor at the end mm -hmm. and I kind of told him what I was dealing with, he was amazed mm -hmm. that I was in a position to walk, to walk home, yeah, with everything that I was going through. Mm -hmm. He was like, wow, so this isn't God good. Yeah. It's not how I started. I said, I was a lot worse then than I am now. So <laughs> that's why I'm out here. That's facts. Well, no, uh, thank you, you know, like I said, for um, choosing to sit and talk to us. Um, you know, choosing to be vulnerable and, and honest and real, you know, it's my hope and prayer. I, I know it's going to be, uh, but you know, I'm hoping that the people that listen to it, that they take away as many gems mm -hmm. as I did. I wish I had a notepad and everything like said, to, we, to take notes, but it's all recorded. So yeah. you know, I can just play it back. But you know, it's funny because it, it's life is so amazing is you never know what people remember, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know? So everyone, different people can hear this and different people can take. And I say, remember they talked about this? No, I don't even remember that part because I was right. thinking about something else. So yeah. that's the beauty behind conversations like this because everybody may pull something different. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you.